Hi everyone, welcome to Moms Writers Club. As usual, we are giggling before we even get started. I am Jessica. And I am Sarah. And today we have a very special guest. This is Shay Galloway. She is a member of Moms Writers Club, one of our original members, and she is the author of the upcoming The Valley of Sage and Juniper. Welcome, Shay. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> we are so excited to have you here with us. Um, you have, like I said, been part of Moms Writers Club for a long time now. You and I have met in person and talked about all kinds of writing things, and I'm just so excited that your debut is coming out. Please give us a quick like and subscribe so that we can reach more people who might enjoy programs like today. All right. Shay Galloway began writing stories almost as soon as she learned to spell. Her short works range from gritty fiction to reflective personal essays and have appeared in numerous literary journals, including the Lindenwood Review, Literary Mama, Scribble Lit, and the Nation. Mm -hmm. Okay. She studied English at Utah State University and received an MFA from Roosevelt University in Chicago. She currently teaches college in Washington, where she lives with her husband and son. The Valley of Sage and Juniper is her debut novel, releasing March 21st. Woohoo! Congratulations. It's very Jay, can you tell us, can you tell us a little bit about your book? And can you do you have a copy that you could hold up for us there? Because I don't have yeah. my copy yet. I have it here. Yay. It's got tags in it for doing readings. <laughs> <laughs> where to stop and where to start. Uh yeah, so. It's been a long time coming. I It was my MFA thesis originally. Um, I graduated in 2017. So it's taken since then, essentially, to get it published. Uh, it is the story of two sisters named Genesis and Isaiah growing up on a ranch. And a mysterious preacher comes through and sort of turns their whole life upside down. Uh, he kind of starts a little cult commune and their mom goes to live on it and eventually takes them to go live on it and then they do escape and get back to their ranch uh, and sort of have to deal with him his name is leader and he tries to continuously take their land from them and they have to kind of deal with that um, it spans about 15 years and it's told from the point of view of both uh, both sisters so starting from the time they're young children to uh, about their mid-20s I have read about half of Shay's book so far, and it is the sort of book where you're like, it is my bedtime, but just one more chapter, which of course <laughs> turns into like several more chapters. I I honestly do not read a whole lot of historical fiction, but I, I really love it. And it's so beautifully told. Your language is just amazing. And I... Um, Sometimes when like there are sisters, I have a hard time telling who is who, but your characters are so well defined. What was it like going back and forth between the two sisters? Because, you know, in some ways you know, they have similar upbringings. Like, yeah, that was something I was quite concerned about when I was writing was I was always like, does, whenever I would have like workshops, like, do they sound different? Like I need them to sound like they grew up in the same house, but I was concerned that they were going to be like the same person. And I think one thing that really helped is one is told in past tense and one is told mm -hmm. in present tense. So right. that automatically gave me something to sort of latch on to and how to differentiate. And then I also really had to think about like where they were each telling the story from. Mm -hmm. um, so like Genesis is telling the story, not only in past tense, but that narrative distance is a little bit farther for her. All right. She's telling it from way into the future. Um, whereas Isaiah, who is a lot more impetuous I don't know if that's the word I'm looking for I, was I have say so many words that I can't like remember oh um same I think impulsive. it's a that's time. the word I'm looking for <laughs> she is a little impetuous but uh she's a lot more impulsive and so she's telling the story for sort of right as it's happening it it took some getting to know them yeah. for a while I actually love that choice of Genesis being telling the story in the past tense and Isaiah telling it in the present tense and the way that that choice like supports the characters that they are, you know, that Isaiah is kind of like more kind of rebellious and um, and like her character is very immediate and very, um, I don't know. And then Genesis is like the older sister and she's a little more um, circumspect and 
she's more straddling. I feel like she's more straddling the like um, convention versus resistance, you know, whereas Isaiah is more like resistance. And I just love the way that tense choice like supported that, that that Genesis has the slightly more like thoughtful, not removed, but you know, when you're telling something in the past tense, it's like there's there's a reflective quality that's not there in the present tense. And I just thought it was so cool how that like supported their character development, just the choice of tense, you know? Okay, so Shay, you mentioned uh, that this was your project when you got your MFA. I would love if you could talk to our audience a little bit about what made you decide to get an MFA, what it was like, uh, and any thoughts you have for anyone who is considering getting an MFA as it is frequently spoken about in the writing community. Yeah, so for me, I, I, my undergrad was also in creative writing. It was English with a creative writing emphasis, which just means I took more creative writing classes than most English majors. And so like, I always knew that I wanted to be a writer. I really didn't want to go to grad school. Um, but then after I graduated, I really missed college <laughs> and decided I wanted to be a professor. And so I sort of had to get a graduate degree. I wasn't set on getting an MFA. I was also looking into MAs in literature and just anything in English in general. But I had reached out to a bunch of like chairs and deans of, of the different uh, master's programs. And most of them emailed back with like a form email that was just like, look at our website, like look at our, like find all of your information on there. Uh, a couple did email me back personally, but one was like, we don't have any funding. So like it's all paid for up front and it was like 40 grand a year. And I was like, yeah, that's not happening. Uh, and then one emailed me back sort of very personal letter, uh, informal and was like, yeah, we have some funding and just like emailed me yeah, directly. <laughs> um, and so I just kind of applied there because they're expensive. So I was like, I'll just do that one. And if I don't get in, um, we'll see. And so, yeah, I, applied and like something glitched in the system and my application like didn't all fell out all the way oh, shit. but I still like it still got there and he ended up calling me like one-on-one -on -one and spoke to me about the program and I just felt really good about it so I ended up um going to Roosevelt in um Chicago and like I was just talking to a friend about this but I don't feel like I learned like thinking back on it, I'm like, I don't remember like any specific thing that I learned that I didn't know already or like I couldn't have accessed somewhere else. I just see it around elsewhere. But I feel like it was really beneficial for me. Like I became a lot more confident in who I was as a writer. And I think that was partially from my professors. It was a very small program. There are only two full-time professors. Um, and it was two and a half years, so we kept seeing each other all the time. Um, I think Were they you... let in about 12 people a year, so. Did solid. you go in person or was it um, low res? It was in person, but it was very much built around like working adults. So mm -hmm. we had night classes. I think I only took one day class the whole time. Cool. Yeah. And I, it, and it was independent study because I didn't have time to take the other ones. Um mm -hmm. So yeah, it was in person, just nighttime um, for two and a half years. And it did really, yeah, it worked for me. I think I went in with the idea of writing like a very contemporary literary piece. And um, The Valley of Sage and Juniper actually started as a short story that I wrote very last minute for, for class. Um, and I just kept going and going and going and I just kept thinking about it and then I eventually decided to change what I had thought was going to be my thesis and ended up writing this and they were very much like why do you want to why are you trying to write literary stuff when like you obviously do well writing about rural towns in the west which is like to me that wasn't literary and I was like nobody wants to read that so yeah it just sort of gave me that confidence and like my short stuff tends to be slightly weird. And so they were like very much like, do it, like get away with your your weird stuff. So um, that was sort of my journey. Personally, I don't think that you need an MFA if you just wanna write and if you don't have the money to 
do it because it is kind of expensive. I think that there's a lot of information you can learn by going to conferences and reading books and being parts of communities, but it did give me a lot of networking as well. Uh, I came from a background that, you know, art is not a viable, you know, any sort of art or creativity is not a viable um, career choice. And so, like, I didn't know anybody that had studied in the creative, you know, sphere. I didn't know that many people that even went to college. I didn't really know how to network. I didn't know, you know, about finding writing groups. And so, for me, that MFA, like, gave me that. I was able to have mentors that were connected to the publishing world and have a built-in um, workshopping group. And I still talk to a lot of them. And like, as a student there, I got to go to AWP, which is a really big writers conference. Um, and I got to go there for pretty cheap. And so that was me being introduced to like writing conferences. So if you are an introvert like me and like have a hard time, like putting yourself in those positions to like make that networking like it's a good way to build a network because you're sort of forced to do it and you're just in there um so that was that would be sort of my suggestion is look for one that is cheap and as funded as much as possible um and try not to go into too much debt for it if you can for me I was going to be a professor so I was like well I'm gonna I'll go into right. debt for it but if you're doing it as a hobby essentially I wouldn't go into debt for it <laughs> I have a question. So yes. when you were taking creative writing in college, did those classes introduce you at all to the idea that your work could be published or should be published or how to get it published or like in a your undergrad? Bit. Yeah, um, mostly to like journals. I don't think we mm. ever really talked about like getting an agent, but, but I they do did remember least, just sort a little of... bit about magazines. Yeah, like that you did at least have the mm -hmm. idea that you could submit to literary journals mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah, I took a fair amount of creative writing in college. I mean, this was a long time ago. And like, in reflection, I'm like, so surprised that I was never introduced to the idea that publishing was like, like, a that's that you big. should like submit your stuff and mm -hmm. get it published. And that's the thing that writers do. Mm -hmm. um, and be that like publishing is a career, yeah. agenting and editing and working at a publisher. Like sometimes I look back and I'm like, if somebody had introduced me to that idea, <laughs> like things might have yeah. gone very differently. But anyway. Yeah, it was very like, it was just very much like, here's how you submit to a literary journal. <laughs> and like yeah. that was pretty much all I got. Um yeah. but I I think I don't think my college had it, but like you could major in publishing. Mm. And I think that maybe that's where it ran into is like, you can just go into publishing and learn about publishing or you can be on the right. other side and learn how to write. <laughs> exactly. It's really interesting. I took a fair amount of writing courses too in college. Well, a few anyway. And you're right. They never even mention it. And I feel like for Isn't anyone who weird? wants to be a successful writer, well, it's such a big part of it. And um, I mean, there's a lot of ways to learn about it now, but there weren't when I was in college, you know, mm -hmm. the internet existed, but people were still doing typed out and mailed snail mail queries. I'm not sure I even got that much of it in grad school. Isn't it funny how those two things are like, I don't know if it's separate. like, they just, I like as a professor, like on the other side now, like sometimes I just forget what I like, don't like, didn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know if it's just like, they were like, yeah, you get an agent and just like never thought that they would have to tell someone else how to do that. Right. right yeah. So I'm like, I don't feel like I got it that much. Like mm -hmm. I know both of my professors were agented, but it was not something that they ever like. I also wonder how long they've been agented because I have a few author friends who have been agented for like 20 or 30 years. And it was so different then that without a lot of research, they wouldn't know how to talk about it now. Like they'd probably right, need to bring right. someone else in. Speaking right. of, can you tell us what you, whatever you feel comfortable with, uh, what you like, what classes you teach at the college you teach at and like what that experience is like as a writer? Yeah. So I teach at a community college. So there's usually more focus on like vocational tracks there. So I don't really get to teach creative writing a lot, but my program is very open to like putting creative writing in our composition classes. So I most, mostly teach like the first two uh, level composition classes and I try to get some creative writing in there. Every now and then I get to teach like a lit 
class. And I've, I've taught a couple of creative writing classes. It's interesting coming from the other side because like I always had a pretty good experience with my professors not being like the, you need to be J.D. Solinger kind of people and like ripping up papers. I've heard horror stories of workshop classes where like the teachers are just brutal. Um, but I, yeah, at, a, at community college, it's always it's interesting to like see the students because they're also coming from a lot of backgrounds where like they're first generation or like they have family that's very focused on like you need to you need a vocation like you need to mm -hmm. only study something that's going to have a very specified job at the end and so a lot of the creative writing is like they're like oh I like writing but I've never like gotten to explore it um, and it's sort of like a nice breather for them and they also are coming into the into the classroom with this idea of like you have to write, like my idea of literature was always like uh, middle-class white men lamenting about how hard it was to be a middle-class white man. <laughs> <laughs> and so like they also come in with this idea of like, that's what you have to write to be a writer or you have to write like YA dystopian fiction, like nothing against YA <laughs> dystopian fiction, but like that's mostly what's geared toward them because I teach very young. Some of them are still even in high school. Um, and it's like, you can write whatever you want to write about. Like my job is to get you to write what you want to write in the best way possible. So yeah. um, I try to be very open to like, I'm not, I'm not a sci-fi writer, but I can help you make it sound good. And mm -hmm. I can guide you to somebody that would know more about that. It is, I feel like becoming a teacher has made me appreciate all of my pre previous teachers before. So you mentioned earlier that you went into your MFA program planning to write something more literary. And I will say like what I've read of yours has like that incredible, beautiful language that like good literary fiction does, but also has so much more uh, like just it's such rich writing and the setting is so rich and you can like you just feel like you're there because oh, it's yeah the west you know and and I was just wondering so it sounds like you kind of stumbled into historical fiction maybe but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your choice of genre but also your um I know I've heard you mention you want to write in other genres too so I, I would just love to hear anything you want to say on that topic in general yeah I sort of just accidentally found myself writing historical fiction I've always loved history so it's not really a surprise uh I think what usually stops me from writing most contemporary stuff is technology. Like, mm. I don't know how to write. Like, I just feel like it's so convenient. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. You guys do it well. It's like trying to have a mystery while also still having like technology. Because for me, I'm like, oh, if I don't know something, like I can just Google it. And so mm -hmm. I'm like, it's hard for me to think of like believably how to incorporate technology or like even like a lot of books I read as a teenager in my tiny little hometown library, the books were all from like the 90s, the 80s and 90s. So like I, I remember there was a scene in a book and a girl like got a, a cell phone for a nanny gig and she like excitedly called up all of her friends to say she had a cell phone. And I was like, that just aged as this book so much. <laughs> uh, so I was like, I I just taking technology out was just like, easy for me but yeah I've just always really loved history and I actually with the Valley of Sage and Juniper I actually waffled between like time periods it was going to be set in the 50s for a little bit and then I just like needed it's set in the 30s and so um, I just needed something that leader has a secret and I was like oh it would be more believable in in the 30s so and then like by my short work tends to feel kind of historical because again I don't put technology in it but I often so I don't know if you guys remember in, in the 90s there was that like trend of trying to feel very retro so there was like rockabilly 90s I'm trying to think of like I think like Stuart Little the movie Stuart Little was mm -hmm. like that and like Mouse Hunt was like that um uh -huh. and I so I always kind of my short work always sort of feels a little bit like that where I'm like oh trying to be like retro but like still modern I would love to write a dark academia and I'm kind of like I have like a nebulous nebulous idea for that um and I would I fantasize about writing like a, an epic fantasy but I don't really read it that much so I don't I read it as a kid and I think I just have that nostalgia factor of 
big epic fantasies. I have thought of like a contemporary novel, but I'm like, I don't think I'm going to write it for a while. I think I need to be a little more mature before I figure out how to write it. Could you tell us about the research you did for this book? Yeah. So I did no research for the first little bit. (laughs) Um, I, so a lot of it is based on, I just remember my grandpa like telling me stories Oh, like, cool. like of his like wild youthful days like living out in these mountains of Idaho and that's actually sort of where Je- or Isaiah's voice kind of comes from because my grandpa always tells stories in present tense and so like I grew up in that area so it's like I just n- heard of a lot of the history I always grew I grew up with pioneer stories and like stories of outlaws like up in the mountains um, and so I guess I didn't I didn't really do any research originally for that Um, and a lot of it was just based on like things I've heard my grandparents sort of talk about in my youth Uh, and then most of the research sort of then came from like just like really niche things like Mm -hmm. what did underwear look like for (laughs) young girls in the 30s which was like a very weird thing to google like (laughs) what did teen girls wear under their clothes in in the 1930s the things we need to know (laughs) Yeah. And then, I mean, there's not, it is historical, but it's not focused on the history. And I think like that gave me a little more leeway to like not have to research stuff. Um, So it's like, it's set during the great depression and, you know, prohibition, but it's information that all of us have heard before, right? Like listening to PBS. I was also like, as a kid, kind of obsessed with the Great Depression. And I don't know why, but uh, so I've always kind of like known a lot of the like intricacies of the 1930s for whatever reason. That's really interesting. I love how, um, how you brought your grandparents' stories into it. And that's you know, included early in the book. And that's a part that I I just like really loved. And it felt like there was a lot of heart in it. Okay. So I was curious, this book was your MFA project. So I know you've been working on another book. How is it different writing a book outside of that? I don't have a deadline. So that was one thing was like, I was the only person checking in to make sure that I was writing it. So the first draft of The Valley and Sin Juniper, I wrote it in less than a year because I had to. Um, I think I wrote it in about 10 months because I had to turn it in by November 1st. And then the one that I've just been querying, uh, it took me, I started in 2020 and I think it, what year is it now? 2023. 2023. <laughs> yeah, 2023. <laughs> yeah, I started in 2020 and I think last summer, oh my gosh, I can't, I, I can't keep track I think of time. Me, I think last it. summer so yeah my brother got married last summer I think last summer was when I had like finished my first draft so it took me like a good 18 months to write that one um and I just right because I was like I don't have to turn any pages in so it's going to be a lot slower and so a lot of my finishing that just came from the motivation of like wanting to finish it uh and scheduling myself to do it because I didn't have a baby the first book I wrote and I did this time and so I was like I gotta schedule it and if I tried to write at night I would fall asleep so it was very much like I had two hours a day (laughs) to Mm. write so there's that big difference and then I also started researching more for my second book it's a different time frame and so like I've, I've done that and it's been a lot more of like me trying to reach out to others to give me feedback Um, and finding people that would give me the feedback I was wanting and it was a little bit harder I couldn't ask my old professors because they were still teaching and they had you know paying students who were doing it for them but I will say I do love this book but I feel like my next book is sort of like my passion project that's a really good feeling all right are you a plotter or a pantser or somewhere in between I think I am maturing into a plotter uh I Yes. I've always been a pantser and then I usually would just like only plot if I got stuck and now I'm actually trying to draft a third book and I started out stuck so now I really have to plot it I wrote about <laughs> a thousand words and was like don't know what to do now so uh yeah I'm really starting to like okay I gotta plot this out um and now I also now that I've been published I sort of have this push to like produce more I don't know if you guys felt that like I have to like 
write more and I just have to keep writing. So now I'm like plotting a lot of different stories so that I can just like have them ready to go as I move forward. I mean, I feel that, you know, I feel that, but it's not like I have to write more. It's like, oh, I, I want to write more. <laughs> like that was fun. I want to do that some more, like publishing a book, you know, you're like, yeah. I want to do another one and another one and another one, you know, so I better get busy. I feel both. I both want to, but I also have pretty like fast deadlines. So yeah. You're on like more... you have done a lot of books yeah. very quickly. <laughs> you're on a um, shorter time frame, you know, than I am. Yeah. Which is really cool, but I've, I've like moved some stuff back and that's been a good thing. So I can really want to write too, because that's so important. Um, in the process. Okay, so I want to know what your favorite stage of the writing process is. So I love drafting, and Sarah loves revising. And you know, you've, you've had a different experience than us, like with your MFA. And, and I'm just so curious what what you love and what you hate if you have something you hate. Yeah, I think this is also a thing that's changing as my writing career moves on. I have always really loved drafting and like just getting the story down. And like, Maybe it's just this new manuscript I'm working on. <laughs> like, maybe this is just the one that it's like, really, I'm really struggling with it. But now I'm like, I just want this to be done so that I can revise it and make it good. That's exactly. Because it's not right good now. right now. And like, I don't know what to do with it. Like, I know I need more, but I just want it to be good. <laughs> yeah. Mine is a total Frankenstein right now. It's mm -hmm. like, because I keep starting. I mean, I hate drafting. I, I'll just... It's it so might depend hard. on, I mean, yeah, maybe my answer is that it just depends on the story I'm telling. Yeah. This one went pretty, you know, like, I loved drafting it. I loved, like, I think also because I was, like, getting regular feedback and my professors were always like, this is amazing. And yeah. I was like, yes, of course I'm amazing. You should <laughs> give me an A. And, like, uh, and then my second one I wrote really fast, just, I really loved that because I, I think, again, for me, it was, like, a passion project. It was the first time I was, like, writing about race really I haven't written about it before and so it was like my first time kind of really delving into things that I'd been closing myself off from writing about um and so for me that was really exciting and like it's sort of a it's it was sort of a risk some of the um like plot points are kind of a risk to take and it was just so exciting and then now the one that I'm trying to draft I'm like oh it's just I don't know. I don't, I have all these characters and I know that they exist and I don't know what to do with them. I totally get that. I feel like every book is such a different experience and I don't always understand why, but um, the last one I wrote was really, it was like pulling teeth the whole time. And then the one I'm working on now, it's like just flowing and I'm like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> but yeah, every book is so different. Okay, do you have any general writing advice for the writers out there who might be listening? Um, yeah, don't beat yourself up about it. I feel like there's always, there's all, like, don't listen to all of the advice, I guess. And like, being like <laughs> pick which like one that. you like and run with it. Don't try to, like, follow all of the advice. Or, like, I'm not an everyday writer. I never have been. Mm -hmm. um, and I still wrote a book and another full manuscript do what you have to to keep loving it don't don't put yourself in a position to like hate your like hate writing so that's my advice don't listen to advice okay so I know you said that you're querying your um your next book but is there you know what's next for you your book's about to come out are you are you just working on the next book or do you have anything else coming out that's going to be published or um, yeah, I'm mostly, mostly just focusing on this book and then trying to get my other book published. We'll see how long it takes. I wish I had more short work coming out, but I've really been focused on novel writing. Oh, uh, that's kind of a question I had. So when I sort of started out, started writing seriously again, I, I started out on short work and I published a few short stories, um, in literary magazines and, and then I sort of thought I would keep doing it once I got into novel length work, but I sort of didn't. So how, how are you feeling about um, writing short work versus long or do you yeah. feel drawn one way or the other? Is it a time thing? It's mostly a time thing. Like I love just like the quickness of writing short work, like getting a story down, having it, you know, workshopped and like basically it takes two or three months to get a short story 
publishable, even though it might take still a year or two to get it in a magazine. Um, it just is like so rewarding to just like have it feel it makes you feel very productive to like do that I originally had started writing like novels as like a teenager and like long work and I didn't really start writing short work until I was in college because that's sort of what they want you to do they want you to workshop you know a whole a whole story so you can kind of workshop like a plot structure and I just really I love the idea of writing short fiction because it just like makes you feel really productive to like get a whole story down in you know a couple of weeks or months and just like have it publishable within that time frame even if it won't get published for a while um so I really like doing it and like I've never gotten paid for any of my short work but I like have my name out there but now as I've as, as, now that I don't have to like be under the constraints of a workshop I've been focusing more on my novels and like m all of my creative energy is going into long work so I don't have anything left for um for short stuff yeah. but that's how it wound up feeling to yeah. me too I, I like get so immersed in the world of you know the novel that I'm writing that that's just where I am well Shay thanks so much for joining us today uh, where can people find you online yeah so you can find my website shaygalloway.com I'm also on Instagram and Twitter at the Gallo Cat. Uh, I also have a Facebook page, which I don't get on very often, um, but that's also just Shay Galloway or the Gallo Cat. Uh, I also now have a TikTok that I also don't get on very much, um, and I think I'm Shay Gallo Cat there. Um, TikTok is a lot. <laughs> Yeah. I love your videos though, or at least the ones that I've seen on Instagram. They they're legitimately funny or like just very cool videos. Yeah, so you can find me there. I'm mostly active on Twitter and Instagram until each of them die. So well, thanks again for coming, everyone. This is Shay Galloway, and her book, The Valley of Sage and Juniper, is out as of when this posts, and you can grab it at any bookstore. Are you gonna have signed copies still at uh, browsers? Yeah, you can order through Browser's Bookshop at Olympia, um, and they have signed copies there, so you can order from awesome. them. I'll put a link down below. If everyone could give us a quick like and subscribe, that would be great. We have our Wednesday night chats every other Wednesday, and we also have a Discord channel. You can DM me for a link to that. Shay, thank you again for joining us. This has been so much fun, and we'll see you all next time. Bye. Thanks.